gives me great pleasure to welcome Janet Newalder to our program. Thanks for being here, Janet. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. Thank you. Janet, your history uh, and family heritage is so fascinating and extraordinarily unique. So we always start at the beginning with our artists to really understand the roots of, of the artists and where they had come from. So talk a little bit about your family history and share with everyone you know, the deep roots that you have, both in your Japanese heritage and your European heritage. Well, my family is unique because both of my parents during childhood were affected with World War II. These are my Austrian grandparents here in Vienna prior to 1939. And my understanding is that your grandfather was a physician? Yes, he was. Of Jewish heritage? Correct. Yes. And my Austrian grandmother, a draftswoman and also fashion illustrator for a local fashion house when she was rather young, around 19. And they lived in Vienna and um, what was very difficult was they made a decision in 1939 as the Nazis were really coming into Vienna and the climate was really shifting is they made the decision to send the kids to England on kinder transport. So prior to that decision, um, your, your grandfather had a practice. He and did, I and this is actually once um, things really started shifting, all of the Jewish merchants, physicians had to post signage for Jews only. They realized that the tide was shifting and it was very dangerous to stay. And so this decision to send your father and your aunt uh, out of the country, right. I mean. <clears throat> Must have been heartbreaking, although many, many did. And those that did? Those that did, some perished and some, like my wonderful grandparents, did not. Yeah. And this picture is just shortly before the family separated in 1939. And kinder transport, um, children were sent specifically to England, was that right? Or They were sent to England and out of um, Poland and out of uh, Austria and they were sent on trains and many of them went to live specifically with the Anglican families and other families who would offer to have them. and. Kids who are older, mainly older teenagers, maybe 15, 16, 17 year olds, often resided in sort of summer camps and they were farmhands for the local people. So out of the generosity of many, um, many children were saved. Some reunited with their parents, some not. And your, your father ended up with a Catholic family? Actually Episcopalian. Yes. Yes, and he was an altar boy. So that was uh, very interesting. Very that he had that life. And eventually they all reunited in Italy. Yes, they reunited in 1948 in southern Italy, Bari. There's a picture you see here. And then eventually they immigrated to the United States? To the United States. They lived on the Lower East Side and where my father went to a uh, very good high school, Stuyvesant, and um, had reestablished their life in America. And your father also studied medicine as well as your mother, is that right? Correct, both physicians still today practicing. And on your Japanese side? Very interesting, my uh, grandmother here, this is their wedding picture, and my grandmother was actually born in Watsonville, California, and she was among uh, women who were sent back, usually at the age nine or 10, to Japan to live there to be cultured and things Japanese. My grandfather, on the other hand, was born in Wakayama, Japan, just outside of Tokyo, and he came here when he was about nine. Took a train from New York across the United States, never had you know, seen such a vast landscape, sure. and ended up in uh, San Francisco. And I understand your mother, or your grandparents' marriage was an arranged marriage. It was an arranged marriage that lasted until death. <laughs> Amazing. And your grandfather was an accomplished architect. He was. He was actually, um, early on, he went to engineering school and he proposed uh, early design as a student for the Oakland Buddhist Church. 
and he actually won the competition. Yet the Japanese could not be registered as architects. So luckily, a wonderful architect said, "Give this you know young man a chance," and he honestly won the design. And you know, I will stand by him. So the Oakland Buddhist Church is there. It was moved when they put the freeway in, so it was moved a few blocks, and is still standing. So around the same time that your Austrian grandparents were dealing with the war, of course, in America, we were dealing with the Japanese population by interring them. Exactly. And so there was a lot of prejudice. Um, not only were Americans of Japanese descent, their businesses were taken over, they were forced to relocate, they were forced to sell their goods in a very hasty manner. They were transported on buses and you know held in places like Tanferan, just quickly converted horse stalls. So it was a terrible thing. However, the Japanese being the people they are and knowing they were loyal Americans, you know, went. And families pretty much were kept together, so it really was under the best of the worst circumstances, I would say. And the fact that your, your Japanese grandparents ended up in Topaz. Correct, in Utah. In Utah. And the fact that he was an accomplished architect, although, you know, had issues with becoming an accredited architect at that time. Um, I understand he helped build the camps. He actually did, and they owned a car in the camps, and occasionally they went into town for ice cream. And your mother, she was a little bit older, and in fact we have a little picture of right, her. Right, this is her third grade photograph, and we have the original photograph, and when they erected a monument, where Topaz used to be, which is currently farmland, they erected this monument, and there her picture was. They selected her class picture, so it's pretty special. And this is the basic view of the camps, and many of the camps were built in these very harsh landscapes away from anything, um, usually extreme temperatures during the day, and also you know, freezing cold at night. But what was interesting is he was able to work. He was. He, I mean, he, he worked as, as basically an engineer in the camps. The residents were so quickly moved in and evacuated. It was all hastily organized. They weren't really ready, so they were still building, you know, barracks and putting in plumbing and establishing schools. And, uh, but the camps did flourish. They were amazing communities, and later on we'll see, you know, some images from um, yearbooks they produced and cartoons they made and so you know the spirit's pretty amazing. Um, what's interesting about these two families and having different experiences during the war, uh, World War II, um, when we go back to your Austri Austrian heritage it turns out that your grandmother worked for Hitler. She, she did, she worked once the war started, she actually worked in a toy factory first, and then she ended up doing toy design, and then she ended up doing drafting for the Nazi effort. So it, it's a very, must have been strange. And then knowing her husband had escaped to southern Italy, where he was interred in a camp of sorts, but he was the physician there. And, um, you know, the rest of my grandfather's family was killed at, they were at Turishenstadt and then were killed at Auschwitz. So it's, it's a lot to grow up with, but um, wonderful in a way as well. Well, and it <laughs> infused a sense of history. I mean, this wonderful respect and reverence for your family um, is extraordinary. And, and the fact that your work has this kind of archaeological flavor to it, almost like precious relics of time. And so we're going to see how all of this combined affects you as an artist and developed you into the beautiful human being you are. Many of your grandfather's uh, buildings still exist. Uh, this is the San Jose Buddhist, Buddhist Church. Church. Mm -hmm. And it's in Japantown. It's his most ornate and traditional. The other churches in Oakland and San Francisco have very uh, ordinary exteriors, yet the in interiors are all 
you know, beautiful hand-hewn beams and gilded altars and very traditional. And he was honored by the emperor. He was, and this is, this is the shot, and there's the medal. So he was honored, it was one of the orders of the rising sun, and he was honored as an outstanding um, American of Japanese descent, actually. And eventually he did get his accreditation for being an he, architect? He did, after, uh, when the camps were closing, those who had sponsorship employment could leave. And so he went ahead to New York and got settled with a very good architectural firm, Grusin and Partners, who oddly enough did a lot of work for the military, housing and various other projects. So, so um, he went first and then the family followed and settled. Fantastic. So we're gonna go back to the early um, objects that you were creating um, while in college. Interestingly, you had a very traditional approach um, talk a little bit about these teapots and how they were transitional in your development as an artist. I w had attended the Kansas City Art Institute, which is just an undergraduate college, so basically the whole school existed for us. And we were taught by amazing faculty, Ken Ferguson, Victor Bagalou, George Timok, just incredible, all incredibly different and each year was very different, the way the structure of the program was laid out. But what really ingrained in us was hard work, intensity, passion, uh, amazing visiting artists. So as well as an influx of students from various states coming, and people from California coming into the Midwest using you know, low fire glazes and colors. So this teapot it was the culmination of my vessel making, of my interest in movement, pattern, texture, and it's it's large, it's about 22 inches. It was the super china teapot. So I had abandoned uh, function and gone on to really the expression of the vessel. And so, you know, the, the structure of these has a very traditional approach. And I understand um, you went to graduate school at Cranbrook and Correct. you had a very influential instructor there. I did, and his name was Graham Marks. And I came, I had met him at, uh, in Syracuse at the Everson Museum at a show I had a previous teapot in and we had an amazing meeting of the minds and I went to graduate school. I made these teapots that were complex, again, 30 inches. They transported you to places, they had movement, um, they employed historical references and they were beautiful and he asked me in the critique, well, why the teapot? What else could transport you? And so that's sort of, you know, being a parent now, out of the mouth of babes, the question. And really that was the turning point, um, the quest to really figure out why the teapot. And luckily, Cramper gives you the gift of time without a set curriculum, without a gymnasium, without really anything. It's, it's a very monastic environment there. So I set about really just trying to think about what a teapot was about. It's a container, it's a vessel, expanding my views of that. I'm a vessel, I'm a container, the universe is a container. So just really exploring that, I did a very rigorous series of experimentation. You, you said to me, which I thought was such a great quote, you said, at Cranbrook, escape yourself. That was true. Help everyone understand what that meant. The reason you can't escape yourself is that there is so much intimacy there in the beautiful Saarinen architecture, in the only 20 students in your program, and the lack of curriculum, um, except set out by your resident artist, who isn't even your professor, they're resident artists, they're working beside you. So there's this, this total immersion in, in really the in the quest, and there's time. So without all those, I want to say, distractions of someone else's structure, one must really figure out and wend your way toward a rich place, whatever that may be. And so you started to experiment, and drastic experimentation. So talk a little bit about this image and the this breakthrough image, here. There were so many hours in the day that I realized I, and I wasn't sure what to make because I couldn't make a teapot and I didn't know what a real container was or why I would choose a certain one that was in the realm of names. 
So I decided glaze testing takes a lot of time and I enjoyed it and I probably need this information. So these are all the remnants of my glaze tests and clay tests and I arranged them on tiles because if I were to fire them without a tile on it, they would just run all over. And when they came out, I was thrilled because I saw them, instead of saying, oh, it's a glaze test, I saw them as little narratives. Little narratives about, oh, it's frozen shattered milk. Oh, it looks like, you know, a petrified egg yolk. Oh, that cup is totally solidified because cobalt doesn't melt at a high temperature. So I was making all these wonderful new associations about materials I'd been so familiar with. It was like recognizing something new. And in fact, each of these was a cup at one time with all the glazes in it, and you just put the cup right onto the tile Correct. and put it in the kiln. So that's why Correct. they all and are... And I kind also kind of noticed, you'll see on some of the images over there, sort of a shadow or a flare, so there's a fuming quality. So that idea of cause and effect also, I noticed, something impacting something. Which also recalled a visit to Hiroshima. How did the visit to Hiroshima affect you? Well, I had visited that in 1984 after I graduated from college, and it was a real affirmation because I always felt very strongly about my Japanese heritage and had a great love for my grandparents, but going there just connected me with all the beauty and the richness of all the arts that I had studied and the, what I had lived with and seen with my grandparents, but just to see even this image here of the, it's one of the remaining western structures, it was a bank, and to see the iron structure there reveal the skeleton and just to almost really see it in an anthropomorphic way. Um, there were many other haunting images, the shrine you saw, you know, the beauty, there's that yin and yang, but this image here in the museum, it's the, you can see a shadow there burned in when the bomb went off. These, this was the steps of the bank. And, uh, the, you know, the human blocked the molecular change there. And I just found that not only very haunting, very compelling. And as an artist, just like all the contents right there. Amazing. And these shadow images are, uh, you know, remnants of, of the presence of a human at the time of the blast. And of course, this flashing that you mentioned earlier with your glaze tests, uh, this harkened back to evidence of, of change, molecular change. And when you see this in person, you said it affected you so profoundly. Well, in its absence, we absolutely recognize on a base level, you know, the presence of what's there. And that's what's so haunting. We don't need to see anything, but we know. I found an image that's a little easier to see these shadows. This was a farmer with his, uh, his hay as part of a structure in this hay bin, right. and the ladder, the farmer, and one of his farm implements is all outlined, so it's a little easier to see. Right. Haunting images. Yeah. So here you, you engage in this amazing marriage with the firing process. You started to explore this idea of container but then you saw the kiln as a partner in the creative process. So help us understand that. Help us understand where you were with all of well, this. Well, there were several events. One was a visiting artist named Rudy Stoffel who dealt with all little mixtures, mainly glaze mixtures, but made six inch vessels with them. Lost about 75% of them, but they were very delicate. They were translucent, um, beautiful objects, precious, but grotesque. We also had John Roloff come, another artist who dealt a lot with process, and he spoke about going to the bottom of the sink, getting all the goop, and putting it on ship vessels and firing them, and they looked like ships that had been excavated and crusted, and I thought that was a marvelous idea, and we had a lot of that. What I had realized at this time, too, was the idea of the container, that containers exist. And there are containers. So I started collecting paper containers, as well as people in the studio would leave me paper containers in my space. So this is a matzo box that I filled with various clay mixtures and colored clays. You can see that kind of poking out on top. And I poured that in there. I was doing tilting and coating and pouring and layering. 
And when it came out and fired, I loved it. And what I loved about it was it was a complete narrative. It was full and flush and bulging. The surface was shivering, you know, with age, but there was also color and movement coming out of the top. It was a complete narrative. And the aha moment struck you. You, know, you, you realized you were onto something here. I did, and also along the way I would get moments of confirmation from Graham in the form of little post-it notes, you know, stop the ooze, deflocculation, um, containment, whatever it was. And he really was the Zen master, but total confirmation um, really helps when you're searching. So deflocculation, very important. Tell everybody what that means. It, it's basically a hyper suspension of clay particles. So it allows you with the addition of a very uh, material called sodium silicate to add a few drops and it basically turns something that's very, very dense sludge into a heavy cream without the addition of water. So it can take the stress of the firing and shrinkage. So that would allow you to dip objects. Correct, which is what I also started doing. I thought, oh, if I can fill containers, I can also slip and dip. And so basically, uh, this wall was prepared for review, and these are all the little experiments and fragments of forms I had dipped. So I was mainly dipping natural materials that I'd collect on my walks um, from one side of the campus where I lived to my studio. So there was a beautiful array of textures there, also different papers, cardboards, um, any kind of paper containers, film containers, um, as well as string, rope, um, organic, things from fiber, flowers. So anything I was slipping and dipping, most, many of them fell apart. So for a while, I just put them in these baggies. And putting them in these baggies, almost like archeological finds, you know, these precious little containers. Yes, they were. And they were also really a recording. They were like a vocabulary, really informed not only visually what I was beginning to develop, but also it made me realize, based on the materials I chose, that I, they would become more what they are, just at a different sense of time. And you became a little more figurative and more uh, trying to, to clarify the narrative, creating books, for example. This piece actually was named book, but I simply started innocently trying to manufacture paper to maybe build a house of cards or maybe I don't know what else I was thinking other than can I make paper, but I needed a support system. So I built this sort of uh, slanted waste mold layer, the paper dipped with clay. And when it came out, I looked at it and I said, it's a book, it was born. So it's really beautiful to be present and not, especially with the way I was working, I, I was present and I could notice things in my work. And so I hinged on the book and that was a container, and then I was looking into books and scrolls and Torahs and book burning. And I also made this book here, a collection book, which was nicknamed Whitman Sampler Book, like the chocolates. And I kind of classified and put in there many of those contents of the baggies. So it really was, was sort of encapsulating and parts of my new vocabulary of and form this, and texture. This almost fever pitch of experimentation you know that it's so interesting to talk about all of those early explorations um, and to help everyone understand this kind of dipping process of these objects we have a wonderful example to share so help everybody understand exactly how you're dipping these right objects. what I would do is just have various mixtures uh, high and low fire clay. This, for instance, pine cones, I would just literally dip them in and let them sit there for a while. These pine cones would just become a mold in that the clay, an armature, the clay uh, adheres to them, whereas paper and different fibrous materials and string and rope, they would actually absorb the slip. And so that's really more of when you fire it, they're actually, it really does become like contemporary fossil because one material is replaced for another. So it, it was a very fun process too and even taking a piece of Wonder Bread and dipping it, can I do that? Can I make a bread box? You know, every kid's made that squishy cube, so. Well, and also plant life, uh, you know, even slices of oranges which you brought with you. Right. Um, so, of course, it's limitless. 
anything that you could dip, you could put in the kiln. Right. It was. It was a fun. And then I also created forms like water book, previous piece, leaf book here. I got better at positioning, um, inserting things in between layers so they would transform and and maybe crack and reveal something underneath. You might notice corrugated cardboard there as well. Started to work with color a little bit, um, use some of those glaze tests I use. So it was a very organic process the way the work arose and it really was just, you know, delightful and it was, felt good to hinge on an image. You also said you embraced the grotesque. I did, I did, because I had many things that looked like they had died or they looked tragic or people would say, what happened when they came out of the kiln? Like, what a pity. And I would say, oh, wonderful. <laughs> so this is a huge bundle I made and rolled by myself. You can imagine it was round and I literally um, slayered with um, hardware cloth and Egyptian paste and it was wet and I was on my hands and knees and I'm rolling it and I'm sweating it, I'm trying to bind it and cinch it. And then it comes out, you know, circular to ovoid and looks like ham cracklins on the outside. And I loved it, it was grotesque, but it, again, it tells that story. And the kiln definitely um, informed it. So when like a piece like this, it has a steel rod. It was, what, 400 pounds, did you say? What was it? It was probably 300 or, I, it was yeah, way more, crazy. but I was pushing its Sisyphus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this massive object, and of course the, the complexity of firing something mm -hmm. this heavy and thick, uh, you know, the, the, the fear of it exploding, the complexity of firing something this large, and then not knowing what's going to come out. Right. I mean, this uh, faith in the kiln. But not knowing is all right because something happens and you, each time it goes away, it comes back encoded and informs you in some way if you're open. So that seemed to work for me then. And also it was such rich territory. So and if you could just territory release that. expectation, you'd be a happy person all the time. So that's kind of what I did with, with the art. And I was also doing a lot of reading in the architectural seminar and also writing verbal narratives about this. So I was really, I mean, I was very into it. It was a way of living, I want to say, and working. And still is. Many of the pieces take on different forms, like the pieces that you brought with you today. We have all of these wonderful samples of some of these dipping objects, but they may be arranged differently in one show. Um, the frailty of the work, um, that adds another component to it. So if something gets broken or chipped, you just incorporate it into something else. Amazing. Right, I usually do. Sometimes objects don't quite come out and you make that judgment, okay, dumpster or crush and rework completely, so it's bits. So it just, you know, there is an editing process, but sometimes, yeah, acceptance. It's a problem to be solved. What do you want people to go away with when they see these works? I'd like them to really go away with a question or maybe a curiosity. I don't expect everyone to want to uh, own them or possess them, but to find some interest. So maybe when they walk away and the next day they might look down and say, oh, that reminds me of that. Or, so to create some type of meaning, and sometimes I really think of the work more as a trigger or, you know, if it's a wheel, it's, it's the center and so it sends spokes out to, you know, whomever, wherever, depending on where people are, who they are, age, what they're thinking. This was a piece I created for a tile show at Powabic Pottery in Detroit and it was right around the time my grandfather had just passed. And so I decided to make these tablet-like forms that were about uh, 12 by 12. They're called, it's called Shinda, which means died. She, same character, is four. And so I was really started um, thinking about color here. First piece, white, thinking about white and covering it with the, uh, more as a veil. And then also thinking about apertures, which you see in the second one, opening, things revealing. And then also thinking about um, 
forces from an underneath or forces from above, like almost like some sort of volcanic deterioration in the third one, and then movement sort of up flight. So I was sort of broadening the narrative in an abstract way. Well, this idea of reliquary, you know, containing precious objects, like, for example, when we see these pieces on the screen, the one on the left is made in kind of a Lincoln Log type approach, creating, again, that vessel. This was a series called Two Societies, and uh, I, I like that idea because it was a conversation, a duet between uh, themes and objects. And so I was thinking of maybe a human culture uh, with the Lincoln Log and its sense of intention and geometry, and also the type of objects or tools that might be collected, they were more manipulated, and the form on the right. Basically, I, I took pine needles and created a nest with leaves surrounding, and so um, a container of another type. And the interaction between the two, the goal there? Well, the goal there is that hopefully there's some sort of conversation and through their own nature, like the nest, I could not have sculpted that, the nature of their materials, that it's in dialogue. A dialogue hopefully isn't just created, but it exists because it's there. And then this piece was one of the brushes from another Two Societies piece. And what I was thinking about here is, is sort of a Neolithic brush made out of pine needles and wrapped with string, but then it's displayed on roll steel as well as the railroad spike as a handle. And so trying to create sort of a a recognition of brush, see it looks normal, but then a question or a contradiction in the piece. Well, and often your materials will change based on the location where you were living. That's true. So talk about the influence of steel here and the railroad spike and so forth. I, I started this Two Societies series when I was in Detroit after graduate school making work, and then I continued in Kentucky. So these would be some things that I would find just by the roadside in our studio in University of Kentucky where I was teaching was actually by the railroad track so you'd find a lot of discarded things as well as just metal surplus that I would you know find in the basement of our building. One of the things that I found fascinating about you was wherever you landed, wherever you lived, you've managed to find the art community and engage in the art community and mount major exhibitions as you went. And that's not an easy thing to do. So address that. Help us understand how, how you went about right. doing that. Well, I've always been a hard worker. And that probably, not probably, does stem from the great examples of my grandparents and parents, um, as well as the institutions I've been in. But also, I love people. And also being a teacher, you have kind of an instant community where you go, and it's just a matter of how engaged you choose to make it. But I do um, have always kept up with a handful of students from every place I've moved from, and I've moved 19 times since birth, so moved a lot. And you mentioned teaching, teaching ceramics. I've mainly taught ceramics, some foundation, some sculpture. And uh, it is a real privilege and joy and, well, it's the best job in the world. Also, just to have, you know, the freedom to engage on so many levels with students who are there to learn something. What do your students teach you? They teach me to try to be a better listener, to stay open-minded, to be present because, you know, there's certainly things I want them to learn or I want them to recognize and I prefer sometimes in this order because it's certainly the chronology will help you but it's also acceptance to really see um, them for who they are and really just try to find that balance of being the teacher but also um, letting go and observing and hopefully getting over there at the right time when engagement might make a shift in their work. So here's a, a wonderful uh, piece that we want to talk about, and of course the reference to evidence of something that was there and now is gone. The image of Hiroshima, for example, the woman who was seated on the stairs, who was burned, um, you know, incinerated. Right. Talk about this. 
What I did was I used these flat tiles that are about four by six inches, putting them down on the kiln, and then laying the sculptures on top. And then in an exhibition, showing this alongside the objects that were laid on top. So most people really did not understand any direct uh, relationship, but it was important to me. So it's like another layer, I'm really thinking at this time about encoding the work and also the way these, these tiles are individually hand pounded and, and encoded with human nests, um, much like you know, the impact I felt that first Neolithic pot and saw you know, the human fingerprint and realize I'm part of this incredible you know, lineage of human existence. So it's the big idea of what I was thinking. And then also just the ability, once all those would come out, to arrange them, to think about composition and issues of uh, you know, drawing and painting that I was pretty terrified about, about, but it allowed me an in on those areas. Well, this has a very painterly quality that is quite beautiful. Um, but when you realize that they're individual tiles, all hung individually as well. I asked you about uh, having the option of, of laying these in grout and, and having one big panel that becomes one unit, and you had a very interesting response to that. I think I had different responses. One was that I liked the idea of when, you, when they're not set in tile, and I, you know, they're literally laid one by one, there's the sense that there could be a continuity of time. They're, they are not permanent. Um, also, when they're not permanent, sometimes the way I work, I will evolve them into something else. They might be a springboard toward another piece. And then logistically, this was, uh, I think, six by nine or ten. And I mean, unless I had a buyer, I wasn't going to grout it. So I don't know what I, it would end up in the dumpster, like probably some of my other work had, because <laughs> I didn't, had to move. There's also a very subtle painted edge all the way around. Talk about that. I started uh, doing that because I really felt like some of these pieces need, needed containment and to really differentiate between sort of the looseness and the co-partnership with the kiln and process, but also sort of reclaiming that sense of geometry. I wasn't trying to hide the fact that that wasn't a perfectly square mural, but I wanted that hard geometry and also just kind of offsetting it a bit. But that became uh, a, a more ongoing approach to your installations is to pr paint a containment zone for your pieces, which we'll see yes, it uh, did. as we progress. These images, this idea of the audience taking away something and, and these pieces communicating, talk a little bit about the communication. and you referenced to your classmates who would come after a firing and go, oh my God, what happened? And oh, it looks terrible. Right, and I would get so happy because <laughs> not everything elicits a response. Mm -hmm. And so if you can make something, even if it is, oh, what happened? You know, that, is, that move has moved someone. So um, certainly a different response that I was used to when I made beautiful objects. The experience of taking away from an art object um, you know, we all come with such different lives and different backgrounds, and you shared, right. you know, your parents being in the medical mm -hmm. profession would see these as... Right, the inner ear, or, or the tibia, <laughs> or exactly, or the one in the center, you know, a butcher might see that as, you know, some sort of petrid, you know, leg of lamb with a fishnet stocking on it. Um, so, or a baker, or myself, the caterer on the left, some type of phyllo dough pastry, you know, which has been in a mega booster device. So, but I also started really thinking about the materials I was starting with. I was in California at this point. Everything was gargantuan. So the scale changed. So um, very interesting for me in that way, and so they were, some of them were more anthropomorphic, they were more body-like, and so um, just, you know, I was just on the current and in a different state, so just went with it. So in contrast to this work, we have, again, another more deliberate narrative here, um, these offerings. I made this, this was a show I had at Santa Barbara City College, and uh, these were called Offering Plates, I fired solid balls of 
paper to create these sort of head-like ash forms on the platters. And I put the painted perimeters on there and I was really thinking about what's left and creating an upward you know, movement and just sort of this very sort of meditative space, but also one of you know, gratitude and altar-like. Well, and again, this reference back to your heritage, you know, that's a, a beautiful connection there. The work that followed also brought in literal references to your family. They did, and this was a piece I did called Remembrance, and it was the first sort of foray into historical personal narrative that I had done. And it was very scary, but I was compelled to do it. I had just had a baby. My husband and I had just decided to get married, to buy a house, to renovate the house, and a lot was going on. And then, as it turns out, we'd moved to England, so just a lot going on. So the illustrations on the left there are of the fashion illustrations my Austrian grandmother did when she was 19. These are the camps of Topaz, shots from the Topaz yearbook of the kids sitting around. And I started editing the images. I started uh, having vanishing images, and so these are direct Xerox taken off the machine, fresh, running to my studio, coding, dipping, and slipping, and then smoothing them onto the tile. And then many are coated in beeswax, too, so there's sort of like another layer. They have sort of a haptic sense, tactile sense to them. And just for clarification, this idea of, of Xeroxing them fresh, meaning the toner, it hasn't completely set. So it, it'll, the clay will help it release, like, kind of like a sponge, but in reverse. And then the small Japanese uh, case. For I grew up with a lot of Japanese objects at my house as well as in my grandparents' home, and so I've always loved them, so I thought it was an opportunity to try to use them, and I had made kind of an ovoid pillow form and made an additional ash piece. So. The ash piece being the circular piece. The circular ball of ash, right. And then you made one in reference to your mother. I did. This was called My Mother, My Mother and Me. And uh, it was about six or seven feet by I don't know, three feet. These are hand mirrors that are made. Xerox transfer. She has been living with breast cancer since 1986. So there's collages of uh, coloring book number books breast images of anatomy, images of actually the accumulation tiles, topaz, images of my father, uh, pictures from the yearbook of topaz, and the idea of the rice is sort of the nurturing. Of course, we ate a lot of rice growing up. But it's also, I often try to throw in an element in, in a new piece that I'm unsure of to get a response. Well, you, you made reference to um it was scary to venture into this work. What was, so, what was your apprehension? What was the fear? Well, the fear is, is wanting to be very responsible for something, especially the kind of history I've come from. There's a lot of incredible uh, research, and I'm no expert on it. Um, so just, just to put that out there. And be truthful to your heritage? Be truthful to my heritage, but also be responsible enough, and I encountered that with the books. There's such a great history of the book, book burning. I was burning some books. What did I mean by that? So at some point, you just have to say, ah, I just love the image. I'm going to go with it, or I am who I am. You know, I make it with an open heart, so be it. And I think that's really what I've come to for now. So another installation, absolutely fabulous. And this one's much more complex than it appears to be. This is Celadonscape, and these were a approximately 12-inch pillow-like tiles that came off the wall about two and a half inches. I used the same idea of encoding in that I rolled the slabs. I had a student who had given me some braille cards, so they're encoded with braille. I had rolled them on newspaper, so it kind of gathered. So somewhere between like the Nazca uh, landscape, mysterious markings on the earth, my hands, you know, flesh, the beautiful hills as you drive up to San Francisco, those velveteen hills, and also the use of the celadon glaze as a vehicle referencing uh, Asian ceramics. 
Beautiful. And again, very painterly. To give everybody an idea of these installations, all of these uh, galleries are, are rather spacious, and you need a lot of room. But I understand that when you are, you, there's planning, of course, involved, but boy, part of your process is in the actual install. Right. I do plan and we must plan, um, but for instance, this tile installation you see on the wall, that was an installation that Monica Fermansky and I did, my studio mate, and I had this, she had this wonderful image of this sort of tangle of branches, and I loved it. I said, let's do a project. So we chose on an image and we just said, we're gonna choose this format of this size, um, what colors, she chose the colors. I said, great, I can work with that palette. Let's see how they come together. I'm not sure how. If it's really bad, we won't show it. <laughs> and so the day we installed, we brought it all in, you know, taped the floor, figured out the dimension, and I just said, let's lay it out. We started laying it out. She put some, I put some groupings. Oh, it kind of looks like a flight. Oh, I like that. Let's move things around. So. It was a collaboration of a different kind, and that was the result. But amazing how similarly those medias go together. I never would have discovered that. Photography and ceramics. And ceramics. So you've collaborated several times. This is another collaboration. This is another piece, and this got such a wonderful reception, and we loved it. I think highly successful for our first attempt at merging digital archival media with ceramics. So we have on the left a framed piece of a wonderful chandelier from Cuba that Mon Monica took. And then I just tried to do this very um, earthy, rustic kind of embellishment on it. And then on the right, a uh, chandelier, but large on sticky vinyl. So it had a very interesting sheen to it and then embellishing with these beautiful, fun, just flighty flowers and these celadon-like pieces that I cut with a wire directly from the block. And you could see they're drilled directly in the wall, so there is a wonderful movement and, and flight across the wall. And the frame that they're in is painted on the wall as well. That's actually sticky vinyl. That's sticky the digi vinyl. digital media. So again, another temporal. That is not archival. Yeah. So that was created for the exhibition. So when you took down the installation, the piece no longer exists. No longer exists. And there's several examples of that. These are all painted as well. These wonderful shavings from your trimmings. Talk about that temporal quality. I mean, this idea of installation and having the work be very site-specific. Well, I like the idea of pieces being site-specific because they're about a specific time and designed for a very specific place. Um, this was the earlier piece with the gray trimmings you saw. I always liked the trimmings and I wanted to sort of classify them, so I hung them up in a linear <coughs> fashion. At Oxnard College, I had the opportunity to have a whole room and it had these oddly boarded up panels because it was a house. And so um, these are all the trimmings organized here. But you meticulously lay everything out, but things, change as you're installing. You Things change as I install and this time in the space is really when it all comes together, hopefully. And as you walk in the room, uh, just the air currents alone would cause these pieces to sway uh, and move. They are just perched on there and um, I do like that. Now, I understand you're, you're inspired by a variety of different things. Talk about inspiration and what gets your mind going. I'm inspired by poetry, readings of Pablo Neruda, for instance. A lot of his poetry is so descriptive and rich and the metaphors he's using, so I think about that, the saturation of color. I'm really inspired by images of the Hubble telescope. Took this one, of this is based on the Veil Nebula. I like the idea of microcosmic and macrocosmic spaces and how things look from, you know, above or beneath. And so, I mean, all that, well, that about encompasses everything, Donna. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. The universe so, is a big <laughs> Right, right. As well as just all the time I spent in museums in New York at the Natural History Museum growing up. Those really inspire me as well. Did you have a lot of art when you were a kid? I did. My mother and father were very wonderful signing me up for various things and uh, 
being great providers. So I got to do a lot of classes. And you had an aunt who was a ceramist as well. She was. She was. She worked at the Wiener Werkstätte. You know, so she's a Bauhaus artist. So and I have one of her clay figures today. The pieces that we're seeing on the screen now are similar to the ones that you brought? They are. And so help everyone understand what they're seeing here. The piece is called Fragmentation and it evolved from just a few tablets to a four by six foot table arrangement. These are the slip and dip method for the most part. The forms you see on the upper right, the flat ones that are curved, those are post-it notes with uh, little American flags. So some things I know and I'm thinking about themes and others, they're just interesting materials. So cups, you know. Anything, branches, Asian pear casings, paper balls, paper film canisters, twigs, carnations, <laughs> perhaps a sunflower. There's some sunflowers <laughs> up here. So we're gonna talk about another installation um, at the Fong Gallery, and this was a big installation, even two stories high. This was a great opportunity, and I'd never been given a space so large with so much freedom to drill as many holes as I wanted, mm -hmm. paint the colors. I, little did I know they would replaster the whole gallery when I left, <laughs> but um, they were happy to do that. This is a piece called Filtration. Some of the objects came from that collection continued. So there are objects that were about up to 15 years old. So it's literally, I was thinking about a filtration of all of my vocabulary and information and kind of the bottle-like form, funnel-like coming out in these books at the very end, which were my financial statements that I dipped and slipped <laughs> <laughs> three years ago. So you can imagine how valuable they were. Um, and that was just out of you know, ease and necessity if they existed. And also you've transitioned even more recently into color. Yes, and this was a piece uh, based on the landscape of Mars. These are the clay trimmings. And I like color because it does emotionally direct the viewer and people react to it, as well as myself, and I enjoyed that. And one place people will see your work at the Community Memorial Hospital. Yes, at, and this is the third floor pediatric oncology ward, and I was commissioned to do a piece, and I chose this universal tree of life theme and created a landscape and a stream and caterpillars and hummingbirds and larvae, and it was really a fun experience. Just knowing where it was going, it really gave me a beacon of where to you know, direct that energy. So Great. when you identify a space, um, do you adapt the work to the space? Do you, you know, create work specifically for a location? It goes both ways. It depends what the scheduling is. But with the Oxnard College installation, I reacted to the space. I didn't design it for the space. I actually reacted to the space. Mm -hmm. But the Quan Fong, I knew I had large spaces, so I was thinking scale. This space was quite extraordinary as well. Yes, this was a show uh, fairly recently at Sasaki, an architectural firm in Watertown, Massachusetts, and it was the most beautiful, exquisite, clean space, beautiful lighting, corridor, people moving up and down it all hours, and they really appreciated the pieces. You can see Veil Nebula I did, and that was drilled all directly into the wall, and it really was a beautiful, seamless presentation, and the fact that it was you know, a very active corridor. It really worked beautifully as well as, you know, the lighting, the shifting shadows, very elegant. And the translucency was evident there. And this was a piece called Cloud. And I was moving from sort of objects and nature. I was thinking about moving through the conduit kind of into some other kind of language. Well, it lends itself well to architecture. You know, it has an architectural quality to it. And I would imagine they, they had an appreciation for, their, for your work in scale and texture and, yeah. and accentuating the actual building. They did, and they, this, this piece in particular, this, they wanted fragmentation, but I didn't want to ship all the forms there. So I came up with this solution in that they were all suspended out from the wall and then just did these painted perimeters. And uh, there was 
a lot of examination going on there. So of course they're all architects, but I had this wonderful captive audience and the show was extended three, three months, so they really, they were happy about that, it made yeah. me feel good. So we have just a couple images left to share with everyone. What, what are you working on now? Where are you going now? Well, I'm exploring color and I'm also trying to create more things that are on panel. And some of it is I don't always have the luxury of a whole week to install a show. And I also would like to make some pieces for residential settings that are portable. And also incorporating on a two-dimensional surface, encrusting the surfaces with ceramic elements. So I'm just getting started on that. And you can also take these things on vacation and paint on a 3,200 mile road trip with your family. <laughs> so, you know, trying to fit that into life is important. And you are a mom? I am. How many children? I have two, one to be 13 and one 14. How do you manage studio time and rearing a family? It's difficult, but luckily, the way I'm working now, I uh, work in multiples. I can take some things on vacation. So sometimes the work has changed based on that. And other times you just do what you can and hope for a free day. <laughs> like so many women. Right. You work at night when the kids are asleep and all these years. I do. Work. I work here and there. Yeah. And, and also I don't work full time. I only teach part time. So I have... Um, I have a condensed schedule now, so it's, and the kids are in school, and I have a wonderful husband who, you know, supports us primarily, so I have some freedom, so I can use my time that way. Fantastic. Wow. What do you want to be remembered for? I knew you were going to ask me this question, and I really didn't come up with a brilliant answer, but I'd like to be remembered for, I guess, com creating some compelling objects that uh, make you more aware of yourself and notice interesting things in the world that interest you. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> Should have rehearsed that one <laughs> next time. Oh, well. Well, thank you, Janet. You're thank just you, Donna. wonderful. You're thank brilliant. Thank you very much We're for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.